Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and in our verse by verse study, we have just begun the first epistle to the Corinthians and in our last study, which happened to be our first study in this epistle, we just touched on the first several verses. I talked a little bit about some of the things I, I do as I study, some of the processes by which I study. Uh, some of the uh, the things that I look at when I study, I, I hope that I'll bring more of that out as we go through this epistle. It's something I've never done. Uh, part of that has to do with defining terms, looking at word meanings, looking at the grammar, uh, cross-referencing, uh, reading the commentaries. If you're a little bit, uh, if your mind's just a little bit uh, clouded as to what's going on, you can get other people's opinions of good and godly men of the past who've gone before us, who've done a lot of work, uh, uh, probably a lot of work that we'll never do. Uh, but I wouldn't suggest by any means relying on the commentators of believing just something just because they believe it. Uh, and the same goes for myself. As I've pointed out, I don't want anyone believing something just because I believe it. Uh, the word is study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And as we move forward through these studies, which uh, I understand that there are a lot of people out there that's not interested in this. They're really more interested in the prophetic angle of everything, or they're more interested in uh, something that's a little more comfortable, close to home, uh, the modern, uh, I guess what you'd call conservative approach to the scriptures. Uh, it's not what you're going to find uh, here on this channel. Uh, many of you who have followed this channel, they, you know where I stand uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the process by which we are uh, brought into that very special process by which we're brought into a relationship with God as his children. I hope and I pray, it's, it's my constant prayer, I pray for you all constantly. I hope that as we go through these, these verses that you will be comforted, you'll be blessed, you'll be pulled back away from all of the worry, the uh, all of the uh, uncertainty as to where you stand in in as in regard to your walk your position your relationship with the father and with the son it's been a one of the greatest blessings of my life to talk to you people uh i it's and it's but it it I keep thinking that every time I make a video, you know, I'm going to do something really dramatic that's really going to draw people's attention away from themselves and to Christ. And, and folks, I, I, I don't, I think it's a big mistake when we evaluate our performance or our activity or, or whatever it is or, that we're doing. Uh, and when we look at the results and, and cause it's good, it would be easy to look at, the results of something that we do and, and we don't really receive a lot of feedback or we don't see, there's not a lot of a positive testimony that comes forth from what we've done or, or what we've said. We don't see any results. And so we, therefore we just automatically assume the Lord is not working in us and, and his word really does come back, return unto him void and, and, and that sort of thing. I think that we can have absolute confidence in whatever the Lord, wherever the Lord's placed us in our in our walk, in our life with Him, and whatever He has us doing. I think we can be absolutely confident that He knows all things. He's working all things together for the good. He He knows the paths we take. Uh, when He's tested us, we'll come forth as gold. There will be. We cannot see behind the curtain, folks. Not and that. When I, when I talk about behind the curtain, I'm referring to what God is doing, the ways that he's going about it it's, that are mysterious to us. We can't know everything. 
and ni neither can we know the results of, of what we do uh, or what we're involved in. It's, a, it's, it's also one of the greatest joys of mine to read comments from viewers who have told me over the past four years or so, five years, that uh, this has really helped them. And that, that really is mean, it's worth its weight in gold. So we're gonna we're gonna dig into this epistle. There's 16 chapters. It may take a while. I'm not gonna really push it too hard. I'm not gonna get in any real big hurry. And I think you'll notice that from this video because I'm gonna focus really in on one word, and that word is grace. And uh, if, if much of what I say sounds a little redundant, well, it's, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. When we start a new study, like in 1 Corinthians, I mean, we saw grace in Philippians. We saw grace in Ephesians. We saw grace in 1 John. We saw, we, no matter where we were, we were introduced to the grace of God. I just wonder, folks, just how much how seriously we take the word grace and how how much we really how much time we really spend thinking about the the just how dynamic a word that is we, we tend to I think because I'm convinced that we tend to throw words around as if they really don't mean a whole lot today you know was we're speaking the right language you know we're we're all sounding kind of like, you know, the same, you know, the grace of God, the grace of God. And, and I don't know how many times during your day that you will mention that word, that you'll talk about the grace of God, or you'll mention the grace of God, or you'll hear someone talk about the grace of God. But I think that over time, that words like anything else can, you know, that if it's If it's something that that becomes really just a customized custom part of our 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 theology you know we adopt the word grace we've been as christians we've used the word grace a lot my question folks and I, i'm not i'm sure i'm not phrasing this right but my question to everyone would be just what do we understand about grace now we just have barely begun this epistle and yet we find ourselves with grace and peace peace with god you know it's astounding to me how the human race must look to god you know we breathe his air we drink his water, we eat his food, we enjoy his climate, or yeah, most of the time anyway, we do. And yet the most common use of his name is to curse. You know, it's astounding how the general attitude of mankind is just plain anti-God. And even in the churches today, it seems as though man is exalted and God is pushed down. Most church services seem to be centered around what you do, your responsibilities, uh, the focus is on you, not Christ. What you ought to do, or should be doing, and, and I, I mean, not, folks, in any way, suggesting that you don't have Christian responsibilities, but the supreme message of the Scriptures is what God has done. I've mentioned this before. It seems the most popular verse today is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So why isn't the next verse as popular? You know, not once that I can remember has anyone ever quoted the next verse. 
I mean, that's astounding. It's more astounding when you stop to think that churches have, have chosen that as their favorite verse. Okay, I've got great news for you. Okay, you've sinned and you've come short of the glory of God. Isn't that great? Romans 3.23 is not a sentence, folks. It's a verse. It's common for people to think each verse is a separate sentence. It's not. Romans 3.23 is just a tiny phrase ripped out of a much larger sentence. So why, why wouldn't Christians consider it exciting to quote the next phrase? Being justified freely by His grace. That's good news. That's good news. And it's got to be good news to these Corinthians. I mean, go back and read it, folks. Why, why are we just quoting verse 23? All right, when verses 9 through 26 come as a packaged sort of thought. I mean, at the very least, why do we so often quote verse 23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, with no thought at all for verse 24? Why do we do that? Because we don't want those who, who are who, whom we're talking to, we don't want them to hear the word freely. Is, is that it? I mean, how about, how about we begin reading at verse 10? You know, there's none. We're going to. Let me just read it. There's none righteous, no, not one. I mean, isn't a single one righteous. There's none that understands, none that seeks after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat's an open grave with their tongues. They've used deceit. The poison of asps is, is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon, upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That, folks, is good news. 1 Corinthians, by design, follows the book of Romans. Now, a lot of people don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. They don't even believe that God had anything to do with the arrangement of the books or, or anything else. 1 Corinthians, by God's design, follows the book of Romans. The Bible came into existence by the sovereign design of the eternal, almighty God. And in Romans, we have the revelation of the great grace of God. That when we were his enemies, uh, many of you remember when we studied back through Romans, when we were his enemies, we were not seeking him. Okay? He died for us. We, were, we weren't working for him, yet he redeemed us by the blood of his cross. That's fabulous news. It isn't God's riches at Christ's expense. It's, it's the fact that when we were enemies when we hated him when we were actually working against him cursing him he redeemed us i don't i don't know how long people have to live before they begin to grasp 
how evil the old man is. But until we get a glimpse into the righteousness of God, we seem to have little comprehension of just how evil the old man really is. Dearly beloved, no place in God's word is anything good ever attributed to the old man. I praise God. He redeemed me. I mean, how could we ever get the idea that the old man can do something that pleases God? They that are in the flesh cannot please God. I have fantastic news for you people out there that are listening to me. All right. Contrary to popular belief, you cannot argue anybody into heaven. You cannot tell anybody. Dearly beloved, listen, you cannot tell anybody how to be redeemed. And I'm going to call that great news. I'm going to call that fantastic news. I'm going to call that the good news. Okay? You can't tell anybody how to be redeemed. You can't do it. You know, for I don't know how many 500, 600 videos, I've tried to keep names out of this. I've tried to keep names like Billy Graham out of this. I remember being in grade school, folks. I was laying on the, my grandmother's uh, carpet in her living room. Uh, I was in grade school. I must have been, what, eight, nine years old, as far back as eight or nine. I was watching, I would watch Billy Graham crusades on our black and white TV and and I, like everybody else, believed what I was being told. But what I was told was not the truth. Billy Graham, God bless the man, devoted his entire life to telling people how to do something that they couldn't do. That was not the good news. You come to me asking, how, Steve, how do I believe? I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know. I don't know. I'll give you the names of several pastors who might, but I don't know. I'll tell you to believe. I'll, I'll tell you to believe. The Holy Spirit tells you that. But I also know if you are his, you will believe. But I, I don't know how to tell you how to be redeemed. That's why our Lord said that no man can come unto me except my Father, which is in heaven, force him. That's grace. I didn't want it. But I know I've received it. And what we're, re what we're reading here as, as we begin this epistle is what we've read in so many others. That we tend to gloss over and read over through too quickly. We don't stop and really take the time to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying and to look, to look at that word, to spend some time focused on, meditating on, thinking about that word grace. It just goes right over our head. I'm convinced of that. We don't spend enough time just thinking about it. Grace unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to stop every Christian dead in their tracks. And they ought to look up with awe and reverence and, and you know, praise God for, for those very words. I mean, do we do that is my question. I, I really, I'm sorry... I may, I may spend this whole video pushing this word grace, trying to, to push this word, one word, so far into your consciousness that you'll take the time to really think about what it is you're saying when you say that word. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is zero doubt in my mind that few Christians today really really comprehend the concept of God's grace. 
that they did nothing to better their condition. It, it's, it isn't that we sought God, it's that He sought us. It isn't that we chose God, but that He chose us. It isn't that we worked for Him, it's that He provided for us because we're His children. But what we do is turn that, flip that all around. I mean, turn it around, backwards. And it's, He does that because we're His children. And is it unreasonable in your mind that the eternal almighty God would have a family of his own that he, and that he provided for his own as any loving heavenly father would? So I think we need to keep in the back of our minds as we go forward in this study that this flesh is present in, in, in the Corinthians. In the book of Romans, we were shown the horrible nature of the flesh and the, and the wonderful revelation of God's grace that even when we were enemies, we were redeemed by his death in our place. We weren't asking to, to be redeemed. We were his enemies. While we were his enemies, Christ died in our place. Now in 1 Corinthians, we're going to see the results of that grace. You know, for these people at Corinth, you know, I mean, you know, they weren't the greatest examples of Christian living. And what we see written here in the opening verses is probably, it's, I, I can tell you for a fact, it's not what I, I would have written. I'd have lambasted these folks. It's not what I would have written, but it's what the Holy Spirit wrote. And don't you find that interesting? The least bit interesting. Okay. This introduction would have been greatly different than it is. These people were sinners. They were fighting among themselves. They were having women usurping authority over men. They were doing everything wrong. So we ought to start right out in the introduction. You know, you know, look, you, you, you people, I got, I got really bad news for you. You better straighten up your act or else. But that's not what we have. We have a marvelous illustration of the grace of God. And we've barely even begun our study through the epistle. We just broke the ice here. So mankind is basically, at his core, anti-God. Who is your God? I mean, is it some old man sitting in, in heaven wishing that you'd live a good life, wishing that you'd serve him and sort of subtracting or adding to your reward every day, you know, who really doesn't have a whole lot of power? I mean, oh, he's sovereign, all right, but in his sovereignty, he's willed that you're sovereign. I actually had somebody tell me that. You know, where, the, where you can choose whether to, whether to believe him. You can choose whether to accept him. You can choose whether to obey him. You know, you are the captain of your ship. You know, you're the, the, the determiner of your destiny. You know, is that your God? The greatest criticism that I have ever received as a teacher of, of, of this book over all the years that I've taught is my teaching on the sovereignty of God. If God is not sovereign, what is he? You know, is he some, someone that I can rule? You know, I can direct, I can command. You know, is, is he some genie in a bottle that, you know, if I rub him or her the right way, I can get anything I want? Or is he the God who spoke the worlds into existence? Dearly beloved, you are not the result of some chance mixture of amino acids that resulted in life, okay? Really think this through, okay? If life, if that's true, if life came separate from God, then life has no meaning. You, can just, you might as well just go do whatever you want to do. You might as well live however you want to live. You know, you've got nobody to worship but yourself, you know, and then you die, Surely you don't say, I, I'm sure thankful that I accepted Christ. There, there's that dumb what's-his-name over there. You know, he didn't. He ought to, but he won't. I did what God wanted me to, to do, but, but he won't. So he deserves whatever he gets, you know. 
He deserves hell. Me, I deserved hell once, but but then I accepted Christ. So now I don't deserve hell because I accepted Jesus Christ. And and, and we we just boast about you know that all day long, all all through our life. In fact, we just that's our boast. We can't boast about what we do. Romans three makes that certain. No, I thank my God concerning all of that. He's Lord of my life. He directs my steps. We as Christians know that God's engineering our lives for our own good, for our own learning, and for the good of others. I don't know what God has in mind for you. I don't have a crystal ball. And I don't know what the effects of that design are on others. But God knows. And in this book, we're going to find that that's the God of the Corinthians too. Paul's God is their God. Paul's God is their God. Their God is our God. Paul is, is thanking God for the grace of God which has been given them in Christ Jesus. Are we? Now, this is the second time we've seen the words in Christ. Jesus Christ. We saw it in verse 2, sanctified in Christ. That's a passive voice. You didn't sanctify yourself in Christ Jesus. You didn't set yourself apart for God's use. You didn't do that. Most Christians think they did, but they didn't do that. We have a direct verse that clearly states you didn't sanctify yourself. And we're going to look at at several passives as we go through the text here. You, Corinthians, were sanctified in Christ Jesus, says Paul. These Corinthians, these, these wicked people with all of the carnal things that are going on in this particular setting, the congregation, synagogue, war, whatever, and, and we're going to see that they are carnal in chapter 3, verse 1. God comes right out and calls him carnal. But right at the moment, we have God's gracious introduction. They are his people. Tell me, answer this for me, folks. Why didn't God say here, first and foremost, right at the very beginning, why didn't he say, I thank God you accepted Jesus Christ? Why didn't he do that? Instead, what is Paul thankful for? God's grace. Are you really deeply thankful for God's grace? That would be my question to you. It is by His grace you breathe, you eat, you move, you have your being. And can He do with you as He pleases? If I'm His son, if I'm His child, then everything's got to go just super great, right? I mean, you know, and because, you know, I mean, I have... My father owns a thousand a cattle, a thousand cattle on a thousand hills, however it is... You know, you know, my father's rich, you know, so am I. I mean, you know, why am I going through such miserable circumstances? Can he do with you as he wants if you're his child? If I'm his son, if I'm his child, then everything's got to just really go my way. You know, and if it doesn't, then I, I'm being punished. Is that, you know, basically, basically that's how Christians feel. That's the common conclusion that many a Christian comes to. You know, apparently we're not willing to accept God on his terms. Unto you it has been granted not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. But we don't want to suffer. Years ago, somebody told me, you know, I can never ever serve the Lord again, Steve, because of this sin that I've committed. You know, and he was going to tell me about it. And I said, I don't want to hear about it. None of my business. What sin do you have to commit that would prohibit you from serving the Lord? Or, or more than that, what sin do you have to commit that would annihilate His grace? What sin could you commit that He didn't pay for if He died in your place? I'm positive that a certain amount of suffering is the natural consequence of something that, that we do. 
you know, you, you rob a bank, you get shot in the leg trying to escape, you know, they can't save the leg, so you got to go through life without the leg, you know, it's not going to grow back, you know, you can pray, uh, you can cry, you, you might get a, some super surgeon to, to put a f false leg on, but that's, that leg ain't going to grow back. You're going to live the rest of your life carrying the evidence of a stupid mistake that you made. A sin that you committed. I admit that. But not in glory. Not before God. Only here. That's the grace Paul is thanking God for in the lives of the Corinthians. The ones, these Corinthians, who were a total, absolute mess. Okay? Okay. And you're capable of doing just about anything, all right? But it doesn't mean that it's not forgiven. You're not going to backpack your mistakes to glory, folks, all right? Whatever you do, as far as the flesh is concerned, it doesn't do one single thing to the, to the grace that's in our text right here. One single thing to God's grace in your life. It isn't the anything that we ought to be concerned about as far as, you know, eternity is is concerned. The, the result of some action that you took, I contend that the, the that type of suffering is, is minuscule. Most of the suffering in your life is for the glory of Jesus Christ. And many times you don't even realize that. How do you know, how do you know that the, your worst tragedy in life isn't God's purpose for your life? How can any one of these tell me that you know exactly why God's doing with you what he's doing? None of, none of us know that. If you think you do, you've made it up. God happens to know all of the connections, all of the people, all of the circumstances. Man, the mathematics of it all, of working all that out, is inconceivable to the human mind. But God knows it all. You know, it makes me want to, you know, I've, people have asked me, Steve, what's the difference between faith and belief? You know, belief and faith. Same, same word in the Greek. Here you have one word in the Greek, faith, that describes two realities. One, one is belief and the other is trust. The reality, the, act, the activities of believing and trusting are, are separate. They're distinctly different from one another. But it's the same word in the Greek, pastuo, from the word pastuo, you know, faith, belief. You know, we believe God, but trusting Him is, is something altogether different, though the same, the word is the same. I believe the new man always believes, always trusts, believes and trusts. That's what the new man does. The old man is, uh, I've never done a video just on nothing but the old man. I guess I, you know, maybe I don't want to wallow in, in all that mire, but you know, it's, uh, if Christians just understood that they, they are, uh, not a single natured individual because of the new creation of being made a new creation, that now they have two natures distinctly separate from one another. God has nothing to do with the flesh. And the new man was created in righteousness and true holiness. Where do you want your focus? Okay. And how can the word grace, how can you even bring the word grace into your life, into your vocabulary and your conversation with others where you, you mention the word, you speak that word grace? How can you include that in a personal theology that's built upon law and self-effort? and self-performance. How can you do that? Well, you can't. All you're going to do is confuse people even more. They're already confused enough. This is how he deals. God deals with us in grace. I thank my God always for God's grace, and so should you. 
The grace of God came to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And people seem to, to love exploring all the ideas surrounding the subject of what God can't do. You know, well, he can't make a rock so big, he, that he, heavy that he can't pick it up and stupid stuff like that. You know, here's something. All right. All right. Here's one, dearly beloved. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God of very God, left heaven's glory to become our kinsman and die in our place. Had that not been done, God could not have redeemed you. There you have something God can't do, okay? He couldn't have redeemed you. Now, you could say, as, as, as some have said, well, God could have just simply forgive our sins. No, he couldn't have. Because then God would no longer be righteous. God would no longer be just. That's the very text in Romans. Whom God has set forth a propitiation through faith in his blood for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. Why is he just? Because Jesus Christ died in your place, and you were justified freely by his grace. Justified without a cause. Not because you asked or because you were worth it. I've got absolute fantastic news for you. Not one single one of you were worth redeeming. Nothing in you was worth it, except that you were God's child, and he loves you. And that made it all more than worth it. The central theme of all of human history is the cross. It is finished. It's because Jesus Christ died in your place that you have the grace of God. The word given is another passive voice in the Greek, that which is given, passive voice. You didn't ask for it. God gave it to you, and it's, and it's an aorist. It's done. It's simply a statement of fact that God gave you his grace in Jesus Christ, and that's the only place that he could give it, is in Christ Jesus. He couldn't give it any, anywhere else. That gracious attribute of God would not be effective in your redemption had not Christ died in your place. It was true of the Corinthians. And it's true of us. You know, the, the Corinthians, the most carnal church, and what follows Corinthians? Galatians. What were they? They were the most legalistic church. And after we've looked at the grace of God in Romans... You know, the operation of that grace in, in the midst of carnal and legalistic people. We have the body of Christ in, in Ephesians. I mean, what a wonderful arrangement of New Testament. How can you not say God constructed the order of, of all of this? It wasn't done by any council. Okay, it was done by the sovereign design of the eternal God. Verse 5 that in everything you are enriched. Well, there's another passive. Got made rich. You didn't make, you didn't enrich yourself. Okay? We don't accumulate wealth as we go along. And I'm not talking about earthly wealth, folks. I'm, I'm talking about spiritual things here. We don't accumulate that as we go along. We don't work hard for that, and that's given us as some reward. Okay, we don't get richer by the day in Christ by what we do or even by what others do for us. I, it is, you're thinking about it all the wrong way. We were made rich in Christ Jesus. You can't become any richer than what you already are. That's the, that's the wonder and the beauty of it. It's mind-blowing. There is, we're going to see later on, it's, you know, we, it's how that we're not coming behind in no spiritual grace. The word there is grace, not gift, but grace. We were made rich in Christ. In all utterance, that's speech, the, the word there is, is the word logos. I believe it's saying in all speech and in, and in all knowledge, and that's 
That word is gnosko. That's experiential knowledge. The word there carries with it the meaning of doctrine. And, uh, and that's where we'll pick up next time. I love you all. I truly do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thankful for your word and the time that you've given us to think about it. I just pray that you would seal that truth to our hearts, filtering out all of that which is there. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We love you so dearly, and we so love one another. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.